Hello, and welcome to our first video lecture of this kind of weird week that we have. Uh, we'll be starting into the 1950s today, um, which covers chapters 41, 42, um, and 43. Please be sure to get into your Google Docs. Make sure you are sending me uh, your reading questions and vocab. Um, today, I need you guys to do that. I need you to start on those reading questions, start on that vocab um, that corresponds with these first few notes that we're going to go through today. But um, I'm going to bring the same energy I do every day. So uh, even though we're, we're doing this through online, I figured I'd still look the part. So feel free to comment on the YouTube channel what you think of the outfit. Uh, since you guys are so opinionated, especially my second period. Um, but, uh, you know, let's get out our notes. Let's get going. Um, and let's dive into the 1950s because it's quite a different time period for us than anything we studied before. So, starting out with our post-war politics and readjustment and challenges. Um, one thing you have to understand when we get into the 1950s, uh, Harry Truman never really wanted to be president. Obviously, being vice president to FDR... Uh, he has to get into this because FDR dies while he's in office. Now, this is a daunting task for him. And, and sorry, I have to do this every once in a while or else the video stops recording me. Um, but he has to step in for this guy that, you know, he has been elected four times the president, served three complete terms, got us out of the Great Depression, has guided us through World War II, almost to the end of the Nazi regime. And now, Harry Truman, here he is. He's got to do the rest. He's got to be the one that makes the rest of these decisions. And so, you know, there's a lot of pressure that goes on with that. I mean, imagine next year, your government teacher, and they have to follow me. I mean, imagine, that's a lot of pressure. No matter who you have, um, those are some pretty big shoes to fill. Um, but he, he felt this incredible weight following FDR. Now, the first task was to bring the war to an end. And obviously, he does a phenomenal job of this. Um, he understands that American casualties cannot continue to be high. Um, and people want to see their sons, their husbands come back home. Um, so what he does is he decides to use the atomic weapons in Japan. This is going to bring a quick, decisive end to the war um, and get as many Americans back home as possible. Now, as we talked about last unit in the early Cold War, this is going to be a problem. Because the Soviets don't know we have these atomic weapons. So when, FD, or when Truman starts to use these, um, it's going to start to create this distrust between the two nations. Uh, second was leading the country back to a peacetime economy. Now, think about what we did post-World War I. We really struggled with this. Um, you know, How do you transition from a wartime economy and war production board to you know, making washing machines? Um, cars, building homes. You know, before all these companies and factories were pretty much in the business of making ammunition, making tanks, making planes, making ships, and, and it was steady income because they knew the government was going to buy it from them. Now, it's up to the individual. We have some people that are unemployed. We have some tough times ahead of us, um, but you know, tough times don't last. Tough people do, and the United States is going to prove this through the 1950s. So, next slide, a rocky transition to peace. Um, we announced a package of reforms that later became known as the Fair Deal. Obviously, by the name, you can imagine that it's trying to be fair to everyone, okay? This kind of goes back to Teddy Roosevelt and his Square Deal. Remember the Square Deal we talked about, where Teddy Roosevelt was focusing not only on um, the employees, the employers, um, the consumers, and the government? Well... Here we have the fair deal. The fair deal is to increase minimum wage, increase aid to agriculture and education, and enact a national health insurance program. You know, things that are going to benefit everyone in society, not just a specific group, and, and will be really effective in getting those veterans back on their feet, and also the people that are transitioning out of the workplace after World War II, because we have quite a few women um, and minority groups who are no longer going to have the opportunity to have a job. So they are going to help with this, okay? Republicans tried to stall these programs because, you know, when you look at it from a Republican's point of view, 
This is a lot of government funding that has to go into this. So they don't want to spend that much. Remember, Republicans want a small government. And so they're trying to stop the Democratic president and Truman from overspending or spending above his means. Um, inflation soared. Uh, workers demand wage increases. And so we're starting to see some tension. And all of a sudden, this fair deal isn't really working out as Truman had once planned. Labor unions triggered the largest strike wave in U.S. history, and there's going to be a response to this. Uh, Congress isn't going to be happy with all these workers all of a sudden deciding now that they're not going to go to work. You know, before when it was the country and they needed them so much, everyone was working and everyone's fine with that. But now that everyone's back home and it's back to normalcy almost, and we're talking back to the 1920s and President Harding, but... People aren't willing to give up. They don't want to lose a lot of money. They want to make sure that they are financially well off and they're taking care of themselves. And you can't blame them. Any person will want to make a lot of money and be in that same situation. So Truman has to take this battle to Congress. Our next slide. Uh, for the first time since the 1920s, Congress gained control in both houses. You know, there's a few reasons for this. You know, obviously the war had gone on. People maybe weren't exactly pleased with the way Truman was handling the post-war years and the early Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, and so they wanted to change. And, and the Republicans promised a smaller government and less government spending. And that made a lot of people happy. A lot of people didn't want the government to spend a lot more money because that would mean that they'd have to pay more in taxes. We all know we don't always pay a lot in taxes, right? So the first thing this Republican Congress does is they enact the 22nd Amendment. Now, this is an important amendment. Remember, we've had 13 through 21 so far, but 22 is also very important. Just think, two and two. A president can only serve two terms, all right, um, which is very important. Obviously, we call this the FDR Amendment. Um, now, there is an exception to the 22nd Amendment. If war is declared, that president then can continue to serve um, because all powers are restricted at this point. They can continue to run for re-election. And I'm sure, yeah, you, the question in the back. Um, the question probably is, well, why? Well, during times of war, you want that constant, stable person to be running the country. You don't want your, your ideas to change um, or your tactics to change. So it's really important that we have that continuality um, with our government, all right? Congress also took aim at the labor unions. Again, remember I told you, something's going to happen. When they start going on strike and they start pushing back against the employers and the government. And so Congress passes the Taft-Hartley Act. Now, this act's a little weird in the sense that it placed limits on the powers of labor unions. It didn't get rid of it. It just said labor unions only had so much power, okay, um, which is, you know, obviously something that has been a battle since early industrialization. You know, the labor unions, you have their ultimate force, which is a strike, but at the same time, the government doesn't want them to use this constantly. There has to be a good balance. Yes, they can collectively bargain. Yes, they can demand new things, but... If they get upset, they just can't stop working. And that's what really Congress is trying to tell them by passing the Taft-Hartley Act. Truman step, uh, sidestepped Congress and desegregated the, desegregated the armed forces with executive order um, in 1948. Now, this is our first civil rights, really, movement. Um, you know, we talked about the Double V campaign during World War II. But what we see is... You know, there really wasn't victory for a lot of minorities that fought in the war. Yeah, they won the war, but when they got back home, they still faced racism, segregation, and discrimination. And so President Truman says, well, let's desegregate the military. Let's integrate it. And this will probably be the easiest transition for us because you have to, right? If you join the military and they give you an order, so they say, hey, you, uh, you're now desegregated. You have to integrate. You have to live together. You have to fight together. We can't say no. You can't be like, well, I don't think I'm going to do this with this guy. You definitely have to or else you're going to get kicked out. Everyone has to conform to the values of the military. 
And so it's a great place to start because we control it. You know, when we get to education and we try and integrate the classroom, you'll have teachers that will just say, well, no, I'm not doing it. Or school districts that will say, well, I'll just close. And it's really hard for the government to step in and say, well, no, 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 you can't do that. You have to do it my way. And so the military is one aspect of society that the government completely controls. And obviously the president being commander in chief, he's in control of it every single day. Now, moving on to our next slide. An upset victory in 1948. Um, everyone loves an underdog, right? So the Democratic Party had splintered into uh, three factions. And, and what we know from previous elections, like the election of um, 1860, all right, 1912, when you start seeing parties split, it usually isn't good for that party, right? Because it starts to fraction their vote. Everyone starts getting a little portion of the votes. And so usually the other party does really well. So like back in 1860, the Democrats split north and south over the slavery issue. So that made it easy for the Republican Lincoln to win because he was unified on his topic. So what groups we have? We have the left-wing Democrats, led by former U.S. Vice President Henry Wallace, and he's extremely liberal. So he is like really far to the left, um, which is going to get him some votes, but obviously they're probably looking for a candidate that's more in the middle, uh, someone that's more moderate, someone that's more with the times, um, and with the current issues, especially with the civil rights movement getting ready to start. The Southern Democrats, also known as the Dixiecrats, all right, um, they are, you know, really trying to get us back to that white Southern pride and feeling and confederacy that they had before. So all these Dixiecrats are going around and they're saying, hey, they're trying to desegregate the mil uh, military. What's next? They're going to desegregate schools and then they're going to uh, integrate um, libraries and bathrooms and busing and we can't allow that to happen so it's a lot of this old white southern ideology that the Dixiecrats are encompassing um, and then the Republicans nominated New York Governor Thomas E. Dewey now the fourth candidate and the last Democratic candidate is obviously Truman Truman's going to run for re-election and he has that capabilities because he only served three years um, and he can serve a second time and so, really, this election comes down to Truman versus Dewey. Do the Republicans who now have control of Congress have enough power in the country and have enough votes to get control of the executive branch as well? Now, Truman obviously has a huge, huge upside. He can go to the American public and say, hey, I helped in World War II. I'm a hero. You know, you guys look to me in a time of need, and I deliver. And obviously, he's done really well so far with the Cold War, um, so he has a pretty good track record, and people are going to kind of be drawn to that, all right? Um, Truman is running as the incumbent, which means incumbent. He is the person who already has that seat, so he is the existing president. Um, and Truman narrowly wins re-election. And it's kind of funny, on the next slide, you look at, um, President Truman there holding up a newspaper that the uh, Chicago Daily News printed, and it says, Dewey defeats Truman. He's holding it up. Um, there's a funny family guy uh, references this as well, and you can check it out. But um, everyone thought Dewey would win, right? Historically, every election we've seen with multiple members of the same party have resulted in the other one gaining power. Now, that begs the question, how did he win, Right. I mean, I'm sure all of you are sitting there right now, whether it's a morning, afternoon, or evening, and you're so just wrapped up in this lecture. You're like, Mr. Montgomery, I don't know how I'm going to sleep tonight. How in the world did Truman beat Dewey? Well, it's simple, guys. Think about it. He's a war hero. Everyone loves a war hero. And he was kind of the underdog in this story. And, and he has proven time and time again to be a good leader, ending World War II, making decisions that were best for the United States, and so when it came down to it, the American public weren't ready to have a complete change. You know, they're okay with the Republican Congress, but they don't want to see a change at the presidency because they're all right with Truman and what he's done so far. 